Hello everyone, and welcome back to another quick review. Um, today, I am going to be covering Immortals Phoenix Rising. It came out about a year ago, but I got it uh, about two or three months ago, and I've been playing it quite a lot, actually. It's probably the game I've been putting the most hours into in terms of single-player games in the last couple of months. So I wanted to give my thoughts on it, even if it is a bit late, because I'm sure there are some of you that may not have played this one. Uh, so, let's just dive right into it. To start off, I want to go over the obvious Breath of the Wild comparisons. This game got compared to Breath of the Wild quite a lot on launch, as well as during its independent reviews. And, while the comparisons are there, I do want to try and evaluate this game on its own merits. I may use some small Breath of the Wild comparisons here and there, but for the most part, I'm going to try and evaluate this game independently of Breath of the Wild, because I feel like evaluating this game based on another game doesn't really do the individual game justice. So, uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way before um, we started, and I'm only going to be talking about, uh, I'm only going to be showing footage from the first quest, main quest of the game, so to avoid too much spoilers. Um, so let's keep start with the gameplay. So in terms of the physics, they're pretty good. Um, they're definitely better than Assassin's Creed for sure, which is the other major Ubisoft game that I know of. Um, they're a little janky sometimes, but for the most part, Phoenix, the main character, feels excellent. It's great to control, run, jump, climb. Everything feels pretty natural to pull off, and the world is very fun to traverse uh, with these physics. Like in Assassin's Creed, I know I'm just going right into comparisons, but Assassin's Creed is another Ubisoft game that uses, I'm sure it uses a similar physics engine. The climbing can feel a little janky with the way it's just the jumping in between buildings and stuff is completely automated. Here, it's not that way, because especially because there's a lot more open world to run around. I think that the world is more enjoyable to spend uh, to run through because the physics are a little bit more open-ended and as you progress through the game you get more moves you can do while you're traversing such as a climb jump as well as like different types of dodges and stuff like that which I'll talk about a little bit more when I get into combat but in terms of just the moves you get to make progression a little bit easier like uh, your glider and stuff like that it's really good it adds a lot to gameplay and keeps it fresh um so the climb jump became a lot a pretty big staple of what i'm doing so like in again breath of the wild um you get it right from the start but here you get it through progression and it makes it feel pretty natural once you do get it but it feels like you earned these extra moves that add a boost to your gameplay and in that vein combat is excellent i think it's one of this game's main strengths. It's got a hack and slash style of combat that blends very well with certain strategic elements of combat, such as the dodges and counters, which you have to time perfectly, especially against stronger enemies that can liquidize you in one hit. You have to think about when you're going to place your combos and your dodges and stuff like that in order to get the most out of each opening that an enemy, uh, that an enemy concedes. Uh, so, I think that the combat is, those two elements, the strategy and the hack and slash comboing, blend really, really well together to create a, a fresh style of combat that feels unique from any other type of game I've played before. And, in terms of the weapons you're given, they also add to this. You have a sword and an axe for your melee weapons. The sword is easier to combo with and, uh, a lot faster but its, at, its attacks are weaker than the Axe's attacks, which are much stronger, but they're slower to pull off, and there's more end lag on the attack that doesn't allow you to quickly burst out of it and start moving again. So, um, and they can be synergized, so you can do a combo with the sword and then finish it with an Axe hit for maximum strength, or you can start a combo with the Axe, but if you see an enemy like starting a charge attack, you can finish it up with a sword so you have enough time to finish the combo and then dodge away really quickly, which I really do like. 
I think it makes it so that if they if the two weapons acted completely independently, it would make the game the combat feel a little bit less open ended. So I think having that um, that kind of synergy between those two weapons is really important to make the combat feel like you're kind of open to use your the tools at your disposal in whatever way you feel is necessary. And the tools as well, they can be used in the air. There's aerial combos that act differently than grounded combos, which you can also combine. Um, so you can do a quick sword combo that launches your opponent into the air, where you finish them off with a massive axe hit in the air, because they can't, if it's a ground-based enemy, they can't hit you in the air. And each enemy also has a stun meter as opposed to a weak point, which I like, but I feel like for certain enemies, if they had a weak point that you could exploit, it might make it a little too easy. But for other enemies, it feels like the stun, because the enemies are so weak, the stun meter never comes into play. So I think if they had balanced that, I would have liked that better. Um, so if they, like the, the weaker like foot soldiers had had just a weak spot that you could exploit and you stun them more easily, I think that would add more to the combat because the bigger enemies obviously it makes sense because you're going to be fighting them for longer that the stun meter will take it'll take a longer and more effort to stun them but i feel like having it take so much effort for relatively weak enemies was kind of a misstep because it feels like that stun just never ends up coming into play once once you get past like the first eighth of the game because you're strong enough to basically destroy them like i've only finished um in my one playthrough i finished the first main quest and I can already tear through the foot soldiers without the stun gauge ever coming into play. Um, but I still think that there's a lot to the combat, and it's I haven't even touched on the bow and arrow, which I'll go over now. Um, they're useful. So with the bow and arrow, you also have two methods of using them. Um, you have just a regular bow and arrow. You can shoot them, draw back the bow for power, shoot it. And then you also have Apollo's arrows, which are kind of like this game's version of bullet time, because it slows down the, uh, the it slows down time and allows you to fire an arrow. However, I actually kind of like this better because it makes it so that you can control the arrow's path, and it adds to some unique types of um, types of puzzles and uh, challenges that you have to do in the game. And I think it's a good use of the mechanic they already have set up, as well as providing a lot to, uh, like if you make a mistake with your misfire of an arrow, you can still correct the path of the arrow with the Apollo's arrows. However, I feel like the Apollo's arrows are so overpowered compared to the regular bow and arrow, I just always use them. Because a regular bow and arrow, it's uh, got the same carrying capacity as Apollo's arrows. But I, I just feel like, even when I started the game, I noticed I'm like, these seem too good to be this usable. Like, they can't be... You can't have this much freedom with something that's so useful. Like, there's no reach... There's not that much... You can't, obviously, you can't spam them because you've only got a certain amount of carrying capacity. But you can still use up to eight of them within one shot. So it's not very well balanced in terms of the regular bow and arrow but it still provides a very good ranged combat option. And just like the movement physics, you can unlock different types of moves in combat that allow for more variety. So you can add, like, the aerial combos. They have finishers that you can unlock. You can unlock starters for the aerial combos that allow you to take a... Because for certain aerial combats, combos, sorry, you can use... Um, these aerial com combos on like flying monsters but once you unlock a certain launcher move with your sword you can take a grounded opponent launch them into the air where they can't attack you back and you finish them with an aerial combo which i really like so that added to my uh i added that to my kit and it became a staple of my combat pretty quickly once i got that move and there are a bunch of others you can get like a power finisher for your sword that makes a more powerful attack to tack onto your combo, or a, like a parry, um, which allows you to quickly block an attack and then follow it up with a combo. And the other thing I like about the parries in this game, and like the dodges, so there's not a set type of attack you have to do after a parry or a combo, or sorry, a dodge, and it's more about, so you just get, 
So the dodge is rewarded by giving you an opening to attack them however you want. So if you get the opening from a dodge, you can go and do, do an axe combo, or you can take their go up to them with your sword and launch them into the air for an aerial combo. So it's, it's very open-ended. So I think the combat in this game is awesome in terms of the tools you have at your disposal and the types of enemies you get to fight because you get to fight like foot soldiers giant monsters and they all have different types of attack patterns there's one like gorgon thing that attacks you with its tail so you have to you can jump to avoid its attack and then finish it with an aerial combo that's lower to the ground so there are different there's a lot of different enemies that whose patterns you have to uh you have to know and learn really well so, in terms of exploration, the world is completely open from the start, so there's four main areas with uh, two smaller areas that I haven't had the chance to- uh, well, there's the starting area, which is one of the smaller areas, but the final area I haven't quite gotten to yet, so I'm just telling you my thoughts on the open, uh, like the beginning of the game and just what I think about the physics. So, um, the world is completely open, you can go to whichever quest you want. But it's structured in a way so that from a starting area, you are spit out into one main area. So there's a key, uh, there's a clear progression, but each you could theoretically go to a different area if you wanted. And each main area has a different god that like, kind of represents that area, and they each have a quest um, that you have to follow. So... But in the open world itself, there are different types of puzzles, like sliding block puzzles, navigation puzzles, and memorization puzzles, that they're completely open in the world. And there's also vaults of Tartarus, which are like the Breath of the Wild shrines, which are physics puzzles, or um, they could be anything really. And you can scout these things out using Farsight from the top of tall towers, which could degrade from the exploration in the game, but I think it's fine because you can use it however much you want, and so if you want to come discover all of these things for yourself, you're perfectly, you're, you're welcome to, but it's more like Breath of the Wild in that sense where you can just go to a top of like the Sheikah Tower and you can scout out the shrines, you can just find where they are and mark them. It's more like that, so you just have a general idea of where they are and you can go up to them, and you can go f complete the puzzle. And the other thing is that some of these vaults of Tartarus have pre-puzzles that you have to do. So there's like there can, there's different vaults and different things you have to take care of before you can actually enter the main vault. That you can't scout out from Farsight. So all you can see is just that there is a vault of Tartarus. You don't know what you have to do to get into the vault of Tartarus, which I like. So it's still you still have that sense of discovery and uh, that kind of wonder about the world that you can kind of find whatever you want within it. And the other thing about these puzzles is they're all really good. A lot of the reviews said the puzzles were pretty boring or uh, not well thought out, which I totally disagree with. I think these puzzles are all really well done. Um, they're all fun to complete. Like, that's the main thing. The puzzles are fun. If they're fun, the game has done its job. It doesn't matter if they're... I mean, I think they're particular... I don't think they're insanely clever, but I think they, they're fun, they're clever, and that's all the game needs to do. If it's enjoyable to complete the game's tasks, the game has done its job. And for me, that ga this game does its job in making its tasks fun to complete. And the other type of dungeon, like the uh, Vaults of Tartarus, each god has a main dungeon that you go through to complete their quest and kind of put the bow tie on it and it at the end there's a boss but these dungeons are kind of linear but not really but i think that the, there's like mini quests within each dungeon that are linear so for the first one you have to go through and um hit a bunch of seeds with fire giant like orbs with fire arrows to uh, make the air a lot you so that you can move through the air and um so there's one line of progression for each seed of like each orb and you go through you um for some of them they test your combat some of them they test puzzling some of them they test physics so it's 
not physics the subject obviously but like the gameplay physics your ability to move about the uh the world and so it's combining all these things these aspects of the game into one dungeon that kind of tests everything you've been doing throughout that quest um so i really really like that and then there's a there's a massive combat challenge at the at the very end which um it, it it's easier to learn the enemy's patterns um but there's also a lot to the combat that you can kind of complete in your own way you could be super aggressive with a bunch of attack buff potions which i'll talk about a little bit later or you could go super cautious which is what i tend to do you can kind of rely on dodges and parries and only wait for the safest of openings to go and um just absolutely beat the crap out of the enemy but um i think the open-endedness of the dungeon is also like the dungeon is linear but it's also open-ended at the same time it's hard to explain if you haven't really played it but i think that the dungeons are designed really well um the other thing i would say uh, there's also a pseudo boss in each area so it's one greek hero like the first one is uh, achilles uh i'm not going to spoil the rest of them but achilles is the first one and you have to fight him um if you in his main in his like lair his demon lair um if you don't do that he'll pop about about the world and just kind of harass you and kind of attack you and so you can go in and fight him whenever you want um and it's not too bad of a fight but it's just an extra layer to the to the world that makes it like when when you're going around the world without um with achilles still being able to spawn in and attack you it, it adds a sense of tension to the gameplay and it, it's a lot of fun um because i always have to be aware of like will i be attacked will i be able to complete this quest without achilles just popping up and just started slashing with at me with a sword and um it it adds a lot to the gameplay and makes you want to and it makes you it kind of empowers you almost once you go into that dungeon and kind of kill the boss and it's like you know what it, it makes you feel like you've liberated the world in in that small way even though you haven't beaten the full game yet it still adds that sense of accomplishment because you've done something that will affect the world going forward because that demon won't come and attack you in that space in the world um, so there's also items in that you can find in the world that allow you to brew different types of potions. So you can find mushrooms, pomegranates, figs, and nectar that allow you to brew different types of potions. So you can brew health, stamina, and attack defense buff potions that are handled well. So at the hub world, you can upgrade your capacity for these potions. I did forget to mention that the hub world is where you can progress all the like when i talked about the physics m additions the combat moves that you get and there's certain powers that you can get as well that's all at the hub world so you can increase your potion carrying capacity at the hub world you already have a decent amount of potions that you can carry at the beginning you can survive big fights with the amount of potions you can carry because you can also carry just these pomegranate in terms of health and stamina you can carry raw pomegranates and mushrooms that allow you to recover a little bit of health and you can use those to brew potions that buff your health a lot more so i think those are handled really well in terms of how you progress through them because it also makes me want to keep exploring in the world because if i need pomegranates i have to go to places that i may not have been to before it makes me want to keep going out into the world to find these things that will allow me to keep progressing and becoming stronger so i think these it doesn't have the same range of items as Breath of the Wild, but I think the few items that it does have are used super well in terms of making you want to keep exploring in the world. So I think that these potions and stuff are handled really well. So I want to wrap up by talking about the story. So the story is phenomenal. It's, it's really good. It's funny. It's fun to... Uh, the characters are a lot of fun. Uh... In terms of the, the story, it makes you want to keep engaging with the world because the characters feel like real people that you're actually interacting with. Because the like it's narrated by Zeus and Prometheus, and they keep making quips and pissing each other off throughout the co course of the story. And 
they're um, they they add a lot of dimension to the gameplay because it makes it feel like like you're still you're enjoying what you're doing because you're listening to these guys make jokes and there's another character who follows you around as well and kind of pokes fun at you and makes fun of you and stuff like that and it's but it's all good natured it's not like it's not malicious and it's really fun and the story makes a lot of references to modern culture as well as references to other myths you don't have to know the myths super well but as someone who does know the myths it makes it a lot of it makes it a lot more fun when you're hearing the references they're making to the greek myths um Actually, I don't think I ever mentioned that this story takes place in an ancient Greek world, so yeah. But in terms of the story, that's where you should know that the story does take place in a Greek universe, um, like an ancient Greek universe. The other thing with the story is that it's integrated into the world a lot, a lot better than it is with Breath of the Wild, because the quest line in each area of the world is linear. So you have things that you need to keep going and doing, and it allows for more character development in terms of the way that you progress through the story and your character grows with the story, but it's surrounded by a completely open world. So I think that's the best way to do it. So you have to do linear things within the area, but you have to keep traversing back and forth within the world, and all the quests around you are completely open. So you can do whatever you want within that world, and I think that wraps the game up into a neat package that feels like a great combination of open world and um, linear quest lines. So that's all my thoughts about Immortals Phoenix Rising. I hope you enjoyed this review, and if you did, consider subscribing for more reviews down the road as well as my thoughts on other gaming news and, con and content, just on my thoughts about gaming as a whole. And if you enjoyed this video specifically, please drop a like as it does help. Uh, but that's all I have for now, so thank you very much, and I will see you next time.